So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first Lohan webinar in the year 2021. And today we are very happy to have Professor Pan Jun from Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance to talk about fintech adoption and household risk, risk taking. And uh, Professor Pan, you will have about 90 minutes. So please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the for this opportunity to present our paper. Uh, this paper is joined with um, Xiaomo and Claire. Uh, they are also online. Um, uh, the the fact that this paper was uh, is uh, uh, we're presenting this paper at. And Rohan Academy, uh, Academy webinar is, is pretty fitting because we actually use the data from uh, Ant Group for this project, for which we, we are very grateful. So um, another title, if you think about another title for our paper, uh, or the, our, the motivation for our paper is very much we would like to study household finance in the age of uh, fintech. Um, as we people studying finance know that finance has always been at the forefront of uh, technology development. What's unique about the current wave of fintech is that um, these uh, fintech platforms are actually created by um, tech firms, not uh, finance firms. So in this uh, innovation, finance firms are very much missing in action while the tech firm has been uh, the, the force behind that innovation. Uh, what's unique about these platforms is that they, they enjoy huge giant user bases. Uh, their operation costs are, are usually relatively low and they have a culture of a winner take all. Um, on these uh, FinTech platforms, uh, another very unique feature of these platforms is that uh, users are interfa interfacing with the platform through these super apps. So financial services actually get de delivered directly to these households with, with these super apps. So as such that these apps or these services actually are free of the traditional financial advisors. And uh, uh, Xiaomeng and Claire, we actually have a separate paper studying how in the absence of these financial advisors, how uh, investors uh, make their financial, financial decisions. But for this paper, we would like to focus on the other aspect, which is the all-in-one all in ecosystems. So you have uh, uh, super apps with a wide range of products. There is a lot of uh, interfertilization uh, cross fertilization, cross selling on these ecosystems. And that's going to be a, uh, one of the key features of our paper. And another very unique about this current wave is that these uh, activities that are central to household finance, which includes consumption, investments, payments, they are taking place in fintech platforms uh, through super apps, mostly in China. So China in this wave of uh, fintech development, China is very much on the, on, uh, is the leader on this uh, development. So just to have a quick summary, I think most of us in China, we, we know these numbers. So consumptions, online consumptions is now accounting for a quarter of the total consumption in the country. Uh, you think about mutual fund purchases, it started only around 2013, now it's uh, roughly, as an estimate, accounts for 30% of the total mutual fund purchases are, uh, that are taking place on fintech platforms. In terms of payments, we all know that digital payments is basically everywhere. Uh, so these are the key features we want to capture in terms of how fintech shifted the landscape of house, household finance. In other words, what household finance look like in the age of, uh, uh, of fintech. So to study this, as I said, we are very happy to have this. Uh, we are very fortunate to have access to this ad financial data set, uh, which allows us to look into 50, 50K, 50,000 randomly selected individuals. So on this plot, we have basically uh, three aspects of uh, household finance. 
So let me focus on consumption first. So the top two lines, um, this for, for most of us who are uh, familiar, oops. <laughs> so more the, for most of us who are familiar with the um, with how super apps work in China, this this is the consumption people uh, consume. This is the monthly consumption uh, through Taobao. This is the monthly consumption through Alipay. So these are the two super apps. Uh, if you like to take a quick, quick picture, we also have a color coding in that plot: red for Taobao, blue for Alipay. So you get a you get a picture of uh, how every month among these 50,000 individuals are uh, in aggregate every month how much they consume in millions of uh, uh, IMD. And also you see pretty uh, nice patterns that we living in China all know. These are the uh, double 11 days and uh, these bottoms are the Chinese New Year's. So, so these are the uh, one aspect of the data which captures consumption. But what's unique is that here consumption uh, separated in two components. One is Taobao consumption, basically on online consumptions. The other are the Alipay consumption. And you can see there is an overall trend in that blue line. At the beginning Sorry, of the time, yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering whether this Taobao line uh, contains both Taobao and Kimo, right? I, Kimo. I think so, yeah. Okay. But but I should uh, emphasize that the Alipay consumption it does not include the uh, uh, payment through Taobao. So it, these are two separate uh, consumptions. But what's interesting about this uh, was the trend of this blue line is that at the beginning, aggregate over the 50,000 individual, the amount of consumption for Taobao and Alipay through these two venues are similar. But towards the end of our sample, which is March 2019, you can see a pretty sizable gap. So Alipay is double the amount of uh, Taobao, pay, uh, Taobao uh, consumption. So behind that trend is, is one of the key features we want to capture is that um, fintech, fintech uh, adoption in the sense that through that sample period, uh, offline uh, payment through QR, uh, QR scanning pay has increased tremendously. Let me just give you a picture of that. Uh, so, so I'm moving to uh, the previous picture to the left and uh, here on the right hand side, we are plotting, plotting the ratio of Alipay to Taba, which is the blue line. As you can see at the beginning, they are roughly equal about 100% uh, percent in terms of the ratio of Alipay relative to Taba. Towards the end of our sample, uh, the average ratio is about uh, 200, 200%, which means that Alipay has doubled relative to Taba. On the same plot, we plot the um, some data on the overall market, how much of the offline scan pay relative to the offline consumption. You see that trend that the offline QR scanning is taking a hold in China through that period. So from 2017 through 2018, you, you see an increasing trend of how people are using uh, this offline QR, can, uh, QR scan and that that increase, that push in financial innovation is behind that increase in blue line relative to the red line. So this is going to be a key feature for our for our paper. We want to capture in that uh, through that trend who are the early adopter of the fintech, who are the later adopter of the fintech. That's going to be the feature key feature in our title fintech adoption. That trend is going to be the key component or the key component for us to identify individuals who are early adopters or late adopters. So, so this is one aspect. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor Pan. Yeah. So you mean the uh, FinTech adopter, is this a top adopter uh, a small business or a household? Uh, these are 50 individual households, individual households. Oh, these are okay. Consumers. okay. 
But here we are now looking at uh, businesses. We are looking at the consumer side of household side of the uh, of the alley usage. Okay. So. Uh, uh, excuse me. So, uh, so on the left panel, you plot the aggregate consumptions. So it's a combination of uh, intensive margin and uh, extensive margin because uh, during those periods, there are a lot of new users adopting Alipay to make offline payments. Yeah. So uh, wait, wait, which kind of uh, adoption are you emphasizing on? In, we are emphasizing the offline usage of uh, Alipay. The offline consumption, which is captured, that's why on the right-hand side, we are plotting the off offline QR scan pay, uh, the, the overall trend relative to offline consumption. So that's going to be the key uh, component in Alipay we would like to capture. So, because if you think, uh, go ahead. So is it driven by the expansion, market expansion by, uh, uh, by like uh, more people using it or just uh, like the same people who have adopted the technology? Uh, these are, we're gonna have a fixed panel. So these are 50 individuals. We're gonna attract these 50 individuals from the beginning of 2017 through the March, end of the March, 2019. So this 50 individuals, 50,000 individuals are gonna be living with us through the experiment, through the sample. Um, yes, but some of them might, uh, might not be the early uh, adopters of the, the new technology. That's exactly, so at the beginning, yeah. that's exactly what we want to capture. We want to, so here we are plotting okay. the aggregate uh, pattern. So you see in aggregate, in aggregate they're using more, but there is gonna be a quite a bit of cross-sectional, cross-individual variation behind that blue line. And that's exactly what we want to capture. Who are the early adopter, who are the late adopter? And in our paper, we're gonna uh, label these early adopter as tech savvy who take up the financial uh, new, new, new FinTech earlier. And we're gonna be looking at their behavior in the bottom two lines, which are their um, investments through Alipay, their investments um, on mutual funds. And we separate the mutual funds into two components. The blue lines, these are the, in, in our textbook example, these, are, these will be the risk-free, uh, assets and the red line uh, squared red, uh, with the squared mark marker these are going to be uh, investments in the risky funds that includes equity mixed bond and all other components so we're going to be following these individuals look at their um, fintech adoptions through their alipay and then we're going to be looking at their investment behavior through these risky fund and risk-free funds uh, investments their purchases on these so this is going to be the main uh, kind of, in essence, that's what we want to study in this paper. Uh, thanks for the question. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so, so probably, I don't know the audience, maybe most of the audience are in China, but just, just as a quick summary, what, what Alipay, which is uh, the, the super app behind this blue line, what does Alipay really offer? So prior to uh, the IPO of uh, uh, Ant Group, the non-IPO of the Ant Group, uh, economists actually send out a, a few um, interesting articles. So let me allow me to quote one of the uh, components of that article. It says that Alipay, if you imagine there is a super app developed in Silicon Valley, it puts together main street banks, which are gonna be commercial banks, um, including the payment system. Wall Street brokers, so that includes, um, you know, buying and selling of securities. Boston's asset managers, mutual fund investments. Connecticut's uh, insurers, so insurance uh, brokers. If you put all of, them, all of them together into and shrink them into one app, uh, which everyone, almost everyone used, that would be the Alipay. So, so that's kind of the, uh, what's unique, uh, as I said, what's unique about the current wave of FinTech is these super apps that 
has everything cramped, shrunk into one app. So, so investors, the investors on the other side, they are using these apps, fitting for all of these different activities of uh, that related to household finance. And give us a perfect example for us to study how investors behave under this new age of uh, of fintech. So that's uh, that's gonna be the uh, focus for us today. Uh, that's gonna be the focus for us uh, for us today. Okay. So let me come back to, to kind of, I've already touched upon this a bit, but let me come back and uh, talk about our motivations. So the, so the motivations for us uh, started out with Campbell uh, 2006, when, when in his, uh, John Campbell in his AFA, 2006 AFA presidential address, he talks about, why the study of household finance is challenging. So he listed two most challenging components of that, of that, of that difficulty. One is household behavior is difficult to measure. Basically data is difficult to come by. Second, household face constraints that are not captured by textbook models. Um, so relative to that, back, back, back in 2006, uh, what, the arrival of fintech over the past decade. Maybe one, one decade is an exaggeration because this all happened maybe over the last five, five to ten, uh, eight years. Okay. So what does uh, the arrival of fintech do for us for the study of household finance? We basically are seeing more data uh, from fintech platforms. They are more willing, for example, Ant Group was willing to share the data with us. Compared with the other super cool data in, in household finance, you know, there are famous Swedish data, Finnish data, Charles Schwab data, you have all of this data. What's unique about this FinTech data is that the investors are actually creating, generating this data on FinTech platforms through the super apps. So there is a lot of inter interesting dynamics in the background, how investors are generating this consumption as well as investment data. And moreover, if you think about the all-in-one ecosystem of fintech, so some of the constraints uh, John Campbell talked about that are not uh, captured by textbooks, some of these constraints that uh, household face, uh, they might be dissipating because of the introduction of uh, these fintech platforms. So, so most specifically, um, relative to this uh, motivation, what we want to ask in our paper is that, uh, can fintech lower investment barriers um, and improve household risk taking? So, under you know, under risk taking is a, a pretty uh, a, a standing puzzle in household finance. Basically, uh, to study under risk taking, there are various explanations, including physical costs like access cost, convenience lack of familiarity, lack of trust, lack of uh, financial education. These have all been assigned uh, to explain the under risk taking puzzle. So what can FinTech platforms do? Well, FinTech platforms, they, they provide these consumers with easy access, give them low costs. Uh, apps like uh, Alipay has a huge, has great brand, uh, brand recommendations. People use it repeatedly. So with these uh, features of FinTech, as people are making consumption and investment decisions on these FinTech platforms, um, the convenience reduced the physical cost, uh, increased their participation in the, uh, in the investment space. And also the brand recognition, the repeated usage of Alipay would build familiarity and the trust so that investors are more willing to take risk via the platform. So these are all kind of the thinkings behind our research question is that can these convenience, familiarity, repeated usage, can they help uh, investors uh, break the barrier and improve their risk taking? So this is the one key question we're gonna ask. 
Second is who benefits most from the fintech advancement? Because as you, as you see, we have 50,000 individuals. There are quite a bit of heterogeneity cross individual variations that we could explore. So we, we focus on two, two pieces. We focus on that those individuals who otherwise are more constrained prior to the arrival of fintech, who are these individuals? So Can they I are- add? Yeah. Oh. So I think another thing that the fintech has an uh, information advantage. It has a, it probably has lots of uh, information. Um, you get easier access to information than before. That's another feature um, that we explored in our paper with uh, Shaman and uh, Claire in our uh, mutual fund paper is that the flow of information on fintech platforms are going to be very different from the offline flow of information. For example, financial advisors are missing in, in the distribution of these products. And the investors, they are using the platforms uh, for information. So um, to the extent that the platforms, uh, whatever platforms are willing to display in that super app, the front page, they're going to be very salient in influencing investors behavior so i think the 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 jury the jury is still out there in the sense that you don't know whether it's a good thing or bad thing but you know it's going to be different but but that information flow is not going to be the main focus for for, for our study today thanks june thanks june for the question but thanks for joining the uh, the webinar um, so we're going to be looking at individuals who are otherwise more constrained. So these are going to be individuals who are more risk tolerant. So they would want to invest more, but because of the barrier prior to the arrival of fintech, they were not able to. Also, we're going to be looking at individuals living in uh, areas that are underserved by, by financial in institutions. So that gives the physical barrier. Uh, which the fintech might help break. Okay. So these are going to be the two uh, two components of the individuals we're going to focus on. So for uh, risk tolerance, we're going to be using consumption volatility from Taobao's consumption. These individual fifty thousand individuals, we're going to be looking at their Taobao's consumption volatility to infer their risk tolerance. For the geographical variation, we're going to be looking at uh, local uh, bank branches as a proxy uh, to, to measure whether uh, financial uh, service in that area is high or low. So these are going to be uh, two cross-sectional variations that we're going to uh, focus quite a bit in terms of who benefits more from fintech investment. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So here you're measuring the um, consumption, uh, the risk tolerance using consumption volatility, but actually on top of, it's not the entire basket of household consumption, right? That, that's a great okay. question, yes. So yeah, maybe this volatility is very high, it's not kind of a good measure. Right, so so let me, let me jump to a, a picture, given the constraint of time, let me jump into one picture. So this is the, this is the top of uh, consumption we're going to be using. So, um, so there are on the left panel there are four lines. The green and the black lines. These are the uh, economy-wide online, which is the green, and the black is the offline consumption volatilities. Relative against this uh, background of economy-wide consumption volatility, and by the way, you see quite a bit of seasonality. Against that volatility, we plot the top of consumption volatility in our sample. So these are the our sample aggregated over the 50,000 individuals, their top of uh, consumption was. So you can see it matches in terms of level and the pattern matches with the economy-wide uh, consumption ball pretty, pretty nicely. Okay. Another issue you might uh, you might raise is that. These are only individuals top of consumption. It's not their entire consumption. Uh, we, I would argue that as long as we capture one component of their consumption and we look at the variability, the volatility of that consumption, it's a nice feature 
uh, to capture with respect to that individual. So to the extent that he might have other consumptions, but we can use the, his top of consumption because that's his signature. So if he is a more risk tolerant individual, he might he should be more tolerant to volatility in consumption relative to a less tolerant diet. So that's going to be the salient feature we want to capture in our in our paper. Okay. But but that's that's a great uh, comment. Thank you. So so let me. Uh, this is a continuation in that volatility uh, co consumption volatility. How it's related to risk conversion. Let me um, go back all the way to the beginning of our finance, which is uh, Markowitz and Tobin. Um, so, so if you think about household finance questions, they are as old as finance, financial, modern financial theory. So the, these theories give us uh, pretty good guidance of uh, what, we, what we're going to look in our, in our data. So the key insight we, we're going to be using is uh, the insight from Merton's problem. First is the link between optimal portfolio weights and risk aversion, gamma. So that's a, that's a, you know, depends on how sophisticated you are, you might be using continuous times, uh, um, discrete time, but the key feature, the key saving feature is that investors, when they invest in the risky asset, which is the W star, the optimal portfolio weight, that weight is going to be inversely proportional to that investor's risk conversion. Um, that's that's a pretty salient feature. And the other piece is this is the risk premium of uh, um, of the risky asset. This is the volatility of the risky asset. So this is one feature we want to explore: is that um, portfolio weights are going to be inversely proportional to risk conversion. But the problem is that we don't observe risk conversion directly. And that's the, um, that's the place where we search to theory for guidance. And uh, the theory tells us that optimal consumption volatility is gonna be the, under the Merton model, is gonna be the same as the op uh, optimal uh, wealth volatility, which is gonna be inversely related to risk conversion. So that's what I said earlier when I said, we're gonna infer risk tolerance, which is one over gamma, we're gonna invert one over gamma from that individual's uh, consumption volatility. And that's, that's the theory foundation for our, uh, for our proxy of using uh, consumption ball as a proxy for risk tolerance. So, so this is pretty much the setup in terms of big picture uh, what we want to uh, look at. So let me, let me before, if I don't get time to finish the entire talk, let me actually summarize our key, key results. As I said, uh, our research question, first question is, can FinTech improvement um, um, improve household risk taking? So what we find that increased risk taking um, with uh, increased risk uh, FinTech adoption. So hypothetically, so let me emphasize one more time, what, what we have in terms of the data is the FinTech the, the platform consumption, platform investment. So we don't actually track one individual as he moves from offline to online. So how can we say FinTech adoption increased risk taking? So to make that statement, our variation in FinTech adoption is cross-sectional variation. So we're gonna pick individuals who adopt early versus who adopt later using their early pace uh, uh, usage. As a, as a result, we can mimic that migration from offline to, to online through the cross-sectional variation. So if you move that uh, FinTech adoption cross-sectionally from zero, from somebody who does not adopt at all, to one, to somebody who is uh, highly ad adopting the FinTech uh, adoption, we see that the risk participation, which is a zero one variable, whether that invest in, uh, invest in the risky mutual fund. The, the risky participation increased by 13.6%. Just so that you know, our average in our sample, the participation is about 40, a little bit shy of 40%. In terms of risky share, this is literally the omega star, the W star I just mentioned, the portfolio weight on the risky asset. 
on average, conditioning on we, these are active users. So once we condition on active users, the 50,000 individual becomes around 20K. Their average portfolio weight on the risky asset is about 50%, 45%. Relative to that benchmark, if you improve fintech adoption from zero to one, that person's risky share participation increased by 14%, basically from 45, benchmark 45% plus 14%. Another measure of uh, uh, risky participation is literally we measure their portfolio volatility. So for each individual, over an 18 months period, we actually see their wealth uh, on the mutual fund investments. So we calculate their portfolio volatility and that portfolio volatility is sigma W uh, in the previous slides in an emergence model. So we actually look at their portfolio volatility and see as their fintech adoption in, in, increased from zero to one, how much portfolio volatility increase. So the average monthly portfolio volatility is about, uh, about a little bit shy of 2%. Relative to that benchmark mark, if you increase fintech adoption from zero to one, it increased half of a percentage in terms of sigma W, in terms of uh, portfolio volatility. So that these are the numbers in economic significance. These are the numbers uh, relating to fintech adoption, how much it can improve risk taking. Uh, uh, professor, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, so um, the... Alipay's asset management only captures part of the, uh, yeah. the, the wealth of the individual. And uh, some of the, the, the increasing uh, fraction in the risky share might be mechanical because for a new user in the Alipay, uh, uh, reflected by Alipay data, the risky portfolio uh, weight would, would must be zero because uh, because, because he or she might not have started using the asset management function in Alipay. Yeah, yeah, that's but, why, uh, yeah, let me interject. So that's why we focus on the active users. So these are the ones with at least 100 IMB investment in, in, in fund purchases. Um, okay, and, uh, and uh, does this include the URBAL? No, your boy is not part. Let me go back to that early plot. So in that plot, these are going to be the fund per, uh, purchases, mostly purchased in aggregate. So, so you are right in the earlier period. By the way, the, the money market funds does not include the euro bond. So these are the outside of your bond, money market funds uh, in Alipay uh, uh, purchases. So you can see to the extent you, you know, each individual, their, their adoption of this, you know, investment in a um, Alipay's wealth, uh, Ha, the wealth investment is, there is variation. That's exactly what we would like to capture. But I just want to mention that you look at these four lines, to the extent there is a time trend, it's that blue line especially in the mutual fund investment, you don't see a time trend in the, sense, in the sense that you just mentioned, is that this individual, there is an overall signing up to the, to the mutual fund investments. So, so here, at least at the aggregate, there are variations over time, and there is not a clear trend that relates to the blue, blue line. Okay, I see. And uh, when you select the sample, who we make the selection, uh, like um, uh, to 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 let everybody in the in the sample have over one hundred RMB in investment. Uh, when do you make uh, that uh, sample selection? Is it at the end of the sample or at the beginning of the sample? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's aggregate over uh, over the whole sample as long as they have 100 IMB. What's your idea here? So I, I, think, uh, I think it's better to, uh, to make the selection at the beginning of the sample to, uh, to avoid the, uh, the, the me mechanical mechanism that I, I talked before, because uh, for those ones who haven't adopted, 
the, the risky share must be zero, and then it must be a, some uh, positive fraction of their wealth in the that, in the risky that, portfolio. Uh, I'm a bit. I, I would disagree because we can talk offline because if you condition me on the early sample, you're going to be picking the early adopters through the early sample. You do want to let me uh, let me talk about the second findings. Maybe that that could. Uh, add some texture to to your to your doubts. For each individual, as I said, each, each, all these individuals are going to be in our sample uh, throughout the period. So we, we don't have individuals in and out. So for each individual, so we actually track, uh, we can track their entire um, FinTech adoption uh, progress as well as their um, investment uh, or uh, risk taking increase. So if, if you look at individual level increase in risk taking, and then corresponds to the individual level increase in uh, FinTech adoption, and you find that from, if you remember that plot, uh, from 20, 2017 to 2018, there is a, a huge wave of this um, blue line, which is an Alipay, offline Alipay usage increased. So for those individuals who increased in terms of their fintech adoption, we find that if that number is from zero to one, zero meaning no increase whatsoever, one means this per piece per person actually, this individual increased the fintech adoption tremendously. We find that their risk partici risky participation uh, increased by 1.4%, and their risky share increased by 8.7%. So, so these, this number could, corresponds to that number, but uh, in the first level, it's a cross-sectional variation. My address to some of your concern, the second number of 8.7% 8, 8 increase in risky share, that is a um, tracking each individual to see how much that person has uh, adopted the new technology. Zero is no adoption. One is huge adoption. And you can see for that high adoption guys, his risky share also improved significantly. Okay, thank you. And uh, and we also, as I said earlier, you know, risk taking, uh, portfolio weight, risky participation, risky share, portfolio volatility. These all numbers are related to gamma or one over gamma. So we need to control for risk tolerance which we use consumption ball to do that and our uh, results remain uh, robust. Okay, so that's the key, one of the key sequence of our finding. Basically, main takeaway, more fintech adoption, more risk taking, higher risk taking, uh, risk taking in terms of participation, portfolio weights, portfolio volatility. Second, uh, second sequence of, uh, of this uh, key finding is that Thank this you. is not so much. Can I ask yes. a question? Yeah. So, so this increase in portfolio weight, do you think it's uh, uh, according to, I mean, one of the, uh, what the Campbell's say is that uh, there will be less constraint? There, there, will be, there will be less constraint in the sense that they, the trust of FinTech adopters will be less. Uh, so they will pay more and more. They, they come to trust the app more. They come to um, become more familiar with the, with the app. As a result, they are more willing. If you think about making a purchase between risky asset and a risk-free asset, because a risky asset has more risk, has more volatility, or more information sensitive, so you want to trust the platform in order to make that purchase. So we are saying that as this uh, FinTech adoption increase, they, they are more familiar, they trust more, they are willing to make that purchase. That's our explanation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So the second finding, this is not relate, directly related to FinTech per se, but I think this is for, for, for us studying, um, especially for Junior, somebody studying uh, portfolio allocation, uh, household finance, uh, this is a, a quite interesting finding, is that we find higher risk taken by individuals with higher consumption volatility. So if you remember, 
consumption volatility is one key feature for our, uh, one key variable we want to use to, to proxy for risk tolerance. Here, this is a validation. We find that individual consumption consumption volatility indeed is a good proxy for risk tolerance because you see more risk taken by individuals. In addition, we actually have more textures in terms of what component of that consumption is, uh, is informative because uh, under Taobao, they give us three types of consumption. One is basic consumption, the other is uh, personal development, and the third is consumption for enjoyment. In terms of components, basic gets the highest component Enjoyment, the second personal development is the actually in the aggregate is the smallest component of the total consumption. And yet, personal development actually is a their volatility actually is a pretty informative um, consumption volatility in terms of uh, individuals' uh, risk, to risk tolerance, which we think are, are really interesting. Another interesting uh, kind of uh, texture that we could add is that. We, when we look at risk taking, we actually see individuals risk taking amongst these different fund styles. So we have equity mixed, bond, um, uh, gold, uh, QD, Q, QDI uh, funds. We find that as consumption volatility increased, um, the risk taking increased, that shows up only in equity, the risky assets. So even only for the risky funds, you have a positive relation between consumption volatility and risk taking. For bond funds, the relationship actually is insignificant. It's positive, but insignificant. And more interestingly for gold fund, actually the risk taking in gold fund related to that person's consumption volatility actually is slightly negative, although it's, it's insignificant. So, so this adds quite a bit of texture, I think, uh, in terms of the literature, looking at consumption volatility and linking it to investments, I think this is the one of the uh, earlier papers that gives you this, uh, this kind of a comprehensive uh, study in terms of the link between, between these two. Although in theory, there are a long standing of theories that predicting these types of relations. And the last uh, preview of our finding is, uh, is who benefits the most. So earlier I said uh, for more risk tolerance individuals, they were otherwise more constrained prior to the arrival of FinTech. As a result, with the uh, arrival of FinTech, their risk taking improve, improvement is actually stronger. And that's what we find. And also you might think, well, could, it, could, uh, could FinTech improvement in risk taking be, be overdoing it? Could they be over risk taking? So, so in household finance, actually, we really talk about optim optimality. So here, this is one example. We can talk about what's the optimal risk taking because for each individual, we see their uh, uh, portfolio volatility, we see their consumption volatility. According to the theory, there is an alignment between how much consumption ball each individual have versus how much portfolio ball they have. So we actually can use our data to quantify, uh, calibrate relative to the optimal solution. And we find that among individuals who, are, who have a higher FinTech adoption, the alignment is closer to the optimality. So that's, that's a kind of, a, I would say, a, a second level uh, study in terms of the relation between risk taking and, um, and uh, consumption. Finally, uh, the last uh, finding in terms of who benefits the most, we find that uh, cities underserved by banks. So for that, we use a number of uh, local bank branches as a proxy. We find that cities that are underserved by banks, they actually are the one that benefit the most from FinTech penetration. So these are, I think I've pretty used 45 minutes to kind of give you a summary of uh, what our, our paper is about. Uh, now let me get to the, to the details. Uh, can I ask a question for, from your previous slides? Yes. That's, so according to Merton, your different asset classes, your, uh, your portfolio should be constant. 
So I guess you probably could say that maybe for because you are using more of the app, you get more familiar with uh, equity. So you you have more higher return for equity. I mean higher. No, no, that that's when we look at cross assets. The the point I want to make is that by the way, the, we are not exploring the time variation of that portfolio uh, weight. We are looking at cross sectional variation. So we are the, the variation is gamma. The variation is different individuals with different risk tolerance. It's yeah, not time, time series variation. Everybody should hold this uh, mutual same uh, mean variance portfolio. I guess different people. Whoa, 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 wait. Um, that's, I get to your point. Um, relative to the first line, yes. Well, everybody should hold the same mix, right? According, according to the they, problem, yeah. they may have a different information about right. the asset. So but if you have a pattern, so usually those information are, are noisy. You think that there will be no pattern, but if you have a pattern of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, this uh, the, uh, relative holding, then there may be something interesting. Well, 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 here from equity, from bullet point one to three, what I want to say is that the first one is the the risky portfolio. This the bond fund or even gold. These are more in terms of um, hedging, especially for gold, right? It's using more of a hedging. So, but I, I see your point. The mix, the mixed, if you really take the theory literally, the mix should be fixed. But th th thanks for the question. So let, let me get to the, to the details uh, now, okay? So here- Professor Pan, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Oh, just uh, the last two picture, uh, uh, point, uh, PPTs. Uh, have you taken into account the fluctuation of market? Because as I, as I see, uh, the gold market hasn't you know, increased during your sample period. That might be the negative and significant um, result. Could that be? And the, the, the equity market has risen over the 15, 16, and uh, the late 1920s? So, so we, to the extent we look at, uh, um, so, so this, this picture might give you some, uh, some flavor of, of the data. So mm -hmm. this is mutual fund purchases on the left panel. These are the um, fraction of mutual fund purchases as a total. So these are all risky funds. So we put the risky funds in different components. This is the fraction of risky funds uh, for our sample. And the, the shaded area in the background, that's the CSI 300. That's, you can think about this as an overall level of the stock market in China, mm -hmm. with the driver of the mixed funds. On the right panel, these are the corresponding number for the market-wide uh, fractions. So to, my interpretation of, you look at gold actually is an interesting observation here. You see in our sample, the, the fraction of gold purchase, especially in the early period is much higher than the market wide. Mm -hmm. So there are individuals in our sample who hold more gold. And uh, for these individuals, their consumption wall is not, I shouldn't say that, well, individuals' consumption wall is not that predictive of their holdings of gold. That's the, the earlier result, basically. To well, is that, that, is that the purchases of the people on Alipay? These are, yeah, these are the purchases of gold on Ali's uh, mutual fund platform. That's the third party online pla platform by Ali. I see. I'm from Ant Fortune, and uh, the gold purchases actually uh, the 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 absolute value of the purchases hasn't increased or decreased that much, but the fraction of the yeah. gold at the early stage of Alipay um, was, was relatively higher. Yes, and we we are saying that if you look at that as a left hand side variable, that's their risk taking in terms of gold. Then mm -hmm. consumption more cannot explain it. 
Consumption law has an explanatory power cross-sectionally to explain people's risk taking in terms of mixed bond equity index and a QDI uh, mm -hmm. investment, but not for bond, not for gold. That's the that's what uh, I wanted to say earlier. I think that's an interesting piece of information in terms of what kind of risk taking consumption is linked to that individual's risk tolerance or consumption bar. That's that's the main uh, observation I wanted to make. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So now let me get to the um, to the main uh, results or more details of, uh, of our results. So this is kind of a one page of summary statistics. As you know, summary statistics is always boring. So I put some color to make it more interesting. So, um, so here there are four blocks. Let me focus on the green block first, but that, because that's the most in, important variable for us, FinTech adoption. So fin, for FinTech adoption, uh, the first line we call the Ali frag. That's, that's the measure I, I talked about earlier, which is the fraction of Ali consumption relative to the, to the total consumption. Let me actually give you the, uh, the, the uh, definition here. So for each individual in month T, we look at their Ali consumption and divide it by their total consumption, uh, Ali pay plus uh, Taobao. So that's our main uh, measure of that individual eyes Individual eyes, months T's, uh, individual eyes, uh, fintech savviness in months T. If we aggregate all these individual eyes across various cities in China, and that's the map you see in the bottom. So you see a blue wave in China from 2017 to, to the end of 2018 as fintech adoption increased. So, so, so in other words, the data set we are using from 2017 to uh, March 2019, that's the, in a way, we, we actually are very lucky to capture that data set because during that period, we see that blue wave. And that blue wave allows us to explore uh, the FinTech, different speed of FinTech adoption by individual eye. So that's our main measure. Um, another, uh, just to, since this measure use uh, Taobao's consumption in the denominator, maybe there is some, you might think there might be some uh, weird wealth effect, weird uh, correlation that's increased. So as an alternative, we also use the number of Ali uh, uh, pay, the log of number of Ali pay in each month as an alternative measure. Okay. In addition to the, the level of this two measure, we also look at the change. So here, this is the, on the left-hand side, this is the level of uh, fintech penetration within each city. On the right, that's the change from 2018 to 2017. So you can see the information content in the level versus change actually is, is uh, quite different. On the left, you see in terms of fintech penetration, the darkest point are these uh, areas surrounding Hangzhou and Shanghai and uh, uh, moving over to the inner, uh, parts of China. But in terms of change, you can see the darker points, the darker areas. These are the one with the uh, more fintech improvement or fintech adoption improve more. And these actually, you can see these darker area in the inner parts of, of China. So, so, so two variables are gonna give us two separate information. One is in terms of level of who is more advanced in terms of fintech adoption. The other is in terms of change, who adopted later in 2018. So we're gonna be using that information um, in, in, our, in our study. So that's, that's the fintech adoption. So just give, I guess in terms of quantity, it's not that something so interesting. So let me just skip uh, reading these numbers uh, for you. Another component uh, is consumption. So the pink uh, block is the consumption. One is in terms of level. These are in uh, Chinese IMB yuan. The other is consumption wall. So as one of the earlier, uh, I think uh, a questioner asked, uh, consumption, top of consumption is pretty volatile. So these sigma, these are not in percentage. So this literally is 1.2. So 
rather a very volatile uh, consumption. Um, and these are the variables we're going to use, as I said, quite a bit in to infer uh, investors' risk aversion or risk tolerance uh, from. On the kind of purple bluish block, that's our risk taking. So that's investors' investments, uh, uh, investments in terms of participation in the risky asset. Optimal portfolio, not optimal, just observed portfolio weight, which is risky share uh, on the uh, assets. So, so these numbers are, more me are quite meaningful. 66, among our active users, 66% of the active users participate in risky uh, fund. And their portfolio weight, the amount of IMB they invest in the risky fund is 45%. And their wealth volatility is 1.77% monthly level. So, so right away you see portfolio ball, consumption ball, different order of magnitude. Consumption ball is rather at the individual level is rather a volatile. And in addition to these uh, three components, basically fintech adoption, consumption, and investment, we also have various uh, characteristics individual characteristics. So we pick two. One is gender. You can see 60%, 61% of our sample is female and their average age is about 30 years old. And so that's that's kind of uh, over, an overall picture of, uh, of our sample. Taking that sample, now let's do some uh, tests. So I'm gonna skip that uh, since I think most of our audience is in China, so I'm going to skip off how you do QR scanning. Um, uh, but for me personally, I moved back to China around this time. And actually, I used that scanning first time when I was uh, at the outskirts of uh, Hangzhou, and I was very much impressed. In a way, I was smitten by this uh, new technology. So it's, it's quite a nice that we actually can study this more explicitly explicitly, more extensively in this, in this paper. So, so let, me, let me give you uh, some of these results. And uh, I guess, uh, what's our timeline like? Um, could you, when should I stop? Uh, yeah, I think you still have a half an hour. Is that okay? I have more time than I thought I had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so page 18. So determinants, so this is the first set of our results. Determinants, uh, oh, sorry, before we move, since I have half an hour, let me, let me actually do that uh, picture. So as I said, the most in interesting variable is the FinTech adoption. So here, this is a picture that shows you the cross-sectional variation, cross-individual variation of that FinTech adoption. So if you remember, Ali Frack is the, fraction of Alipay relative to the total consumption, Ali plus Taobao. And the uh, log of Ali count is the intensity of that person using Alipay. Okay. And then we group them into two groups, uh, all users, 50,000 of them, active users, around 28,000. So one interesting uh, observation is that if you look at there in the, each individual's consumption volatility, you do see that Individuals who's, by the way, this is this is on the super app red, which is Taobao. Uh, let me let me know about it right. So 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 Sigma C, if you remember, that's observed from the red app, Taobao app. And uh, the Ali frag, that's actually mostly observed on you suppose Taobao and Ali pay, but mostly it's driven by the Ali, uh, Ali behavior. But you see the link between individual level, you see the link between these two. People with higher consumption wall are the early adopters. They are, have more um, early pay usage uh, in uh, cross-sectionally. So in other, if you really believe Sigma C is a proxy for uh, risk tolerance, then risk, more risk tolerant individuals are early adopters of this uh, FinTech uh, new technology. Another measure um, you see is that log C, which is the consumption level of, on top of, you can see there is a negative correlation for artifact, but positive correlation for uh, count of, uh, um, so, so this is 
this is, as some of you might point out, this is pretty mechanical because our alley frag is as a concentration in the denominator. Uh, but Ali count, the number of the, our alternative measure of uh, fintech adoption, you can see it does not have this mechanical negative correlation. In fact, it's positively correlated. What's interesting is female, you can see female uh, dummy is always negative, meaning that male investors, male individuals adopt the new technology more. And the age, there is slightly some negative correlation, meaning older adapted slow, more slow, slow. So that's in terms of the level of the fintech adoption. This is in terms of changes in, in fintech adoption. So, so you look at, um, let me actually skip that slides. Uh, let me move forward. So in terms of uh, mutual fund, uh, earlier question, uh, in fact, asked about this, where these mutual funds are taking place. So as a big picture on the left panel, it gives you the overall size of the mutual fund in trillions of IMB. And uh, as you can see, a big component is still the money market funds, especially uh, components uh, funds like in Europe. So relative speaking, as an overall market, China's mutual fund is still uh, of a limited size. And I think this is an area that has a great growth potential uh, later on. But what's interesting over that time, and this is uh, studied in uh, another paper, uh, Claire uh, and Shamo uh, and I, we studied together, is FinTech platforms enter into that mutual fund distribution around 2017 and end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013. And Ali was one of the player. Um, they bought uh, Sumi, and then it became the uh, the Ant platform. So you can see uh, Ant entered into that uh, third party or entered into that mutual fund world, started to distribute mutual fund online, and that's the mutual fund investment we 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 captured in in this uh, in our paper uh, in this study. And this, this paper, uh, this picture we already talked about, uh, just give you a sense of how our sample relates to the overall market. You can see similar overall trend. Probably the most visible is the gold uh, bond behavior. Otherwise, similar trend. Uh, another exception is, of course, the bond fund. You can see over the whole market, bond fund presence is a, a much stronger fraction uh, relative to our sample, given that in our sample, these are all individual investments. Market-wide for the bond fund, you might have more institutional investors. But overall, similar sample and similar, similar trend relating our sample to the market-wide. This is a uh, consumption ball we, we talked about. And as I said earlier, we actually have different components of uh, of this consumption component. And then uh, I'm probably not going to have time to talk about this in detail, but it's in the paper is that uh, we actually explore the various uh, consumption component uh, in our uh, study. So now let's uh, look at the main result of our, of our paper. So this gives you an intuitive um, picture of uh, how this, so here, FinTech savviness is the FinTech adoption measure. Basically, it's the Ali frag. So we look at we look at individuals. We sort them by their alley frag or by fintech savviness from the very bottom to the very top. So you can see here different red dots uh, lining up from left to right. What's interesting is that on the y-axis we have uh, three measures of three key measures of risk taking. One is participation, zero one, whether they buy risky fund or not. Where, how, much, if, how much the risky share do they hold in their uh, wells? And uh, how much volatility their portfolio has? So across these three, three measures of risky uh, exposure or risk taking, you can see that Alifrac has a positive relationship. So, so this is a, a very intuitive way to look at our result. It's saying that 
individuals with higher fintech savviness then pay, they, they tend to invest more in risky assets in three aspects of our measure. To look at that number more closely, we can regress individual risk taking on individual fintech savviness. So the first uh, row gives you, gives you that, uh, um, that result. You can see, oh, by the way, the T-stats are in the parentheses. So you can see that coefficient is positive and significant. As I said earlier, risk taking is also related to risk aversion. So the second line, in the second line, we, we actually uh, look at, I think, uh, yeah. So in the second line, we actually look at their, um, their consumption volatility. You can see that in individuals with a higher consumption vol, their risk taking is higher in every measure uh, that recorded here. But after controlling for that risk aversion or risk tolerance, you can see that the relationship between risk taking and the tech, fintech adoption still is positively and significant. Um, as a probably interesting observation is um, individuals with higher uh, consumption tend to invest more in the risky asset. Female invest less, uh, older people uh, invest slightly less depending on uh, your measure of risk, risk taking. But the key takeaway is that higher, higher risk adoption, actually higher fintech adoption, higher uh, tax savviness is cor corresponds to higher risk taking. So that's the, the first set of results we have. Second is, is uh, it's kind of a, a, a change on change. Basically, we, we track each individual. We look at their increase. So this is, this is change in their tax savviness from 2017 to 2018. We look at their tax savviness and then look at their change in risk taking in terms of participation and risk share. The last line is in terms of their uh, trade propensity because it's difficult, it's difficult for us to measure sigma W, which is the volatility of their portfolio over this short period. So we don't have a change measure for that. But overall, the picture is kind of uh, salient is that when that individual, their uh, FinTech adoption improved from 2017 to 2018, their risky share, their participation in the risky asset also increased. And the control, and that's true controlling for, uh, for consumption involved. And the last, okay, the last uh, part of that sequence of FinTech ad adoption of and the versus risk taking is, um, is that we, we look at these interaction terms. So the most interesting interaction term is this piece, is that we look at um, the relationship between risk taking and the tech savviness conditioning on their risk aversion. Basically, we want to see who actually benefit more, who is more sensitive to, whose risk taking is more sensitive to this new technology. And we find that it's those people with higher sigma C, with higher consumption volume, or these individuals with more um, with higher risk tolerance. Put it differently, individuals with higher risk tolerance then actually benefit more from that fintech adoption. So that's the key uh, key takeaway uh, in terms of this plot. I might be running too fast in these tables, so please feel free to stop me with any questions that you might have. So that's the first uh, set of results in terms of FinTech adoption and risk taking. As I said earlier, um, some skeptics might ask that could the FinTech be, um, be promoting over risk taking? Could investors be using the app and uh, taking too much risk? Okay. We, we do have a lot of papers on these type of topics as well. So here we look at the optimal risk taking. 
So on the left panel, we plot individual level. Uh, here, these are grouped into um, consumption. They sorted into uh, uh, sigma C. So each dot is a sigma C sorted uh, group. So in a way, we are sorting investors by their risk tolerance as proxy by sigma C into these various groups. And then we plot their uh, portfolio wall. So you can see a positive relation between sigma W and sigma C. And that's also predicted by theory. If you run a regression, and by the way, as, as you saw earlier, sigma C consumption wall is much more volatile. So we scale it by the um, cross-sectional standard deviation among, that, among the individuals. So these are normalized sigma C and sigma W. According to the Merton model, sigma C equals sigma W, which means that this line should be a 45 degree line, the R square should be 100%. That's the optimal uh, level. So if that, if, if that line, so here in this, within that sample, uh, the slope coefficient is about 0.79 and the R square is 62. So if that line goes above one, one which means that people are over risk taking. If that line is close to one, it's at least according to the Merton model, they are closer, they are closest to the optimality. So let's, let's take a look. So we sort these individuals into the, the purple stars. These are the ones with high fintech adoption. And the, the green squares, these are the ones with low fintech adoptions. And we do the same exercise as the left panel. And here, this blue line is the regression uh, coefficient of uh, sigma, sigma uh, portfolio volatility regressed on consumption wall among these purple stars, among these individuals with high fintech adoptions. And you can see that coefficient is about 0.91 and the R square is 77%. Relative to the individuals, the groups that have low fintech adoption, their uh, coefficient is 0.58 and the R square is 45%. So basically comparing the purple star group versus the green square group or high fintech adoption group versus the low fintech adoption group, you get a sense that these individuals with high fintech adoptions, they're closer to the optimal as prescribed by the, by the Merton model. So that's the, uh, the uh, key, key takeaway of, uh, of this plot. So, so that's. So, if there are no questions here, um, let me let me move on to the to the. Um, to the last set of uh, of the results. Okay. So, as as you remember, I said the last set of results is that which city benefit more from fintech adoption. So, going back to, uh, to that picture. So we're going to be using the city level fintech penetration uh, with two dimensions. One is we look at the, the average level of fintech penetration across different cities. So this will be the, the left panel. And, the, and the intuitively, you know that behind that measure is uh, cities closer to Hangzhou, closer to Shanghai. These are the cities that um, have high level of uh, penetration. So last night I was looking at this area and I was asking my colleagues, which, which city is that? Uh, they told me it's called Transo. And this is where um, a lot of tests, well, a lot of scientists are living. That's why their FinTech adoption is high. On the right hand side, we look at the, the change from 27 to, sorry, from 2017 to 2018 how much improvement in FinTech adoption occurs. As I said, the information content of this left picture and the right picture are very different. So we're gonna use both informations. And that's, that's in, the, um, in the plot here. 
So on the left panel, we are plotting again um, um, stars and the circles. So the stars are the cities. We we plot each for each city. We plot two dimensions of that city. One is that city's fintech penetration. The other is the the risky. Uh, share or the investments of individuals in that city in, in aggregate, equal weighted. So, so you can see across cities, so each dot is a city with the stars being the cities with low bank coverage. These are the cities, not like Shanghai, each street, street corner you see a bank. These are cities uh, with very few bank uh, branches relative to the circles. So if you group them into high and the low, you see that for low coverage uh, cities, the relationship be between risky shear and the fintech penetration is positive and significant. Versus for high bank coverage cities across these cities, the different level of fintech penetration has very little impact on risky share. So, so let me uh, retrace myself, repeat myself one more time. You look at these cities, you look at cross city variation in FinTech penetration. You notice that it's among the cities with low bank coverage. That's the place where risky share becomes sensitive to the tech penetration or cities with more te tech penetrations in, has more risky share. And that's in terms of level. On the right panel, that's in terms of uh, change. So we look at e each city, we look at that city's change from 2017 to 2018, we look at their change in, in FinTech penetration. So on the right hand side, these are the cities with more, more advancement from 2007 to 2018 there is a more in, increased improvement in fintech penetration. And the cities on the left, there is no improvement. Okay? Or some cities have slightly negative numbers. But overall, this is zero. So overall, you know there is a blue wave in China. So overall, all cities, their tech penetration increased. So among, we do the same analysis. We look at among the stars, we look at these are the low coverage cities. Among these cities, you see that changes in risky share versus changes in fintech penetration, positive and significant. So when you have more increase, when, when that city improve on its fintech penetration, that city also improve on risky share. So, so that give, gives us a sense that cities that benefit the most from fintech penetration are these cities that previously, prior to the arrival of fintech uh, adoption, these are the cities uh, without much uh, financial coverage. So in other words, if you think about financial inclusion, if you think about how fintech can improve uh, different areas or different countries in terms of uh, household finance, or their risk taking, then it's the disadvantaged, the cities or the countries with low financial infrastructures. These are the places that can benefit the most from fintech uh, advancement. And uh, here we have a um, kind of a, a set of findings to support that observation. So, um, so these are kind of additional uh, tables that give you more texture in terms of uh, the two pictures I just mentioned. So let me uh, skip, uh, skip that. I, I think I have already made the uh, message, uh, deliver the message uh, clearly. Okay. So let me conclude and let's, let's see if there are any additional questions uh, afterwards. So we study how fintech can improve uh, households risk taking. In particular, it's not only improve, we actually look at how they can move 
households risk taking towards optimal risk taking. So we, we find that fintech adoptions improves risk taking and especially for more risk tolerant individuals. We, can, we see that fintech can all, also move these households closer to the optimal alignment of investment and consumption. We also see that cities with low banking coverage, they benefit more from fintech penetration. To interpret our result, uh, I think June, Julia asked that question earlier. Uh, so let me just repeat this one more time. Why do we see these results? We see these results because um, that's our belief is that fintech convenience reduced the physical cost and increased participation. And also because of the repeated usage of uh, these super apps that help investors build familiarity and trust. And that's really needed when you are making risky investments. And that's why they not only improve participation, they also increase risk taking. If you kind of project, pro project our results into what's the future of FinTech, um, then I think the future of FinTech is brighter for emerging economies like um, places. If, I think it's not surprising that with a weak banking system in China, you see the advancement of FinTech uh, improvement because it's places with low financial inf infrastructures. That's the place that FinTech ha has more of a role. As a, not only do they have a more of a role, they, they survive from less of the pushback from the existing financial infrastructures. And also, as, a, as I start today's talk, I said these platforms are created by tech, not fin finance firms. So FinTech so far has been enjoying quite a bit of, uh, um, of its rise, and the most of that rise is contributed by tech firms. So I think as, as FinTech needs needs to move on to maybe FinTech 2.0, we, we should see more, more of the financial component. In other words, places like Ant Group, you probably want to hire more finance uh, professionals and then you go on for more content building. And uh, um, so far, if you think about how investors make mutual fund purchases, it's mostly just by ranking in terms of how the firm has performed in the past. So adding more components in terms of financial education and financial advisory, all of these components need more uh, thin component. And I think in the future of FinTech, maybe there, there should be more thin rather than tech because the tech component has already maxed out. So that's, that's pretty much all I want to talk about today. Uh, thank you very much for your um, Hi, Jane. Oh, hi, Jane. Uh, Hello. <laughs> okay, sorry. So I'm surprised that in the end, this is, uh, this is a job pitch for yourself. Uh, <laughs> Did you say a job nice pitch try. for myself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. I got to what you meant. I just want to make our uh, profession more relevant for, for this FinTech uh, advancement. Yeah. So I kind of missed the earlier part. So tell me in simple terms, what exactly the difference between the, uh, when is risk taking a good thing? When is it uh, over risk taking? How do we distinguish oh. them? And how oh. was the, if we advance our progress of the financial literacy or exposure, What's the passage pass from the risk taking to financial benefits? So what's exact logic here? Okay, so this paper has more of a say to the first observation, the, uh, more of a response to your first question. Your second one, uh, maybe I can say something as well. So let me start with the first one. Uh, what's the optimal risk taking? So we, you know, in household finance, um, I don't know, household finance is an interesting area, which uh, until today, some, somehow I was, uh, I was kind of attracted into that area because of the FinTech platform. So 
and the, it just happens that FinTech platform very much revolutionized the household finance in terms of consumption, investment, and payment. So if you trace the root of uh, financial theory in terms of household finance, uh, theory actually tells you what's the optimal risk taking. So this is, I'm sure you, we all learned this from, uh, from graduate, not high school, from graduate school, is the, the optimal risk taking is proportional to risk tolerance. And if you look at optimal risk taking and optimal consumption, there should be a link. So according to Merton's problem, individuals, uh, individual level consumption wall is this, should equal to individual level uh, wealth volatility and it's inversely proportional to risk aversion or proportional to risk tolerance. So with that observation in mind, we did that test. So this is the test we did um, and I talk about towards the uh, end of the talk is that on the right panel, we group, we separate the individual. We have 50,000 individuals. We group them into high FinTech adoption, low FinTech adoption. So by, how do we measure FinTech adoption? We measure how they um, take, up, take up upon this early pay usage over the period from 2017 to 2018. Because as I said earlier, there is a blue wave in China over this two, two years period when people are adopting to this offline. So, got it. So let's say, so you're testing that the consumption volatility is related to the uh, risk taking in the investment volatility, very yeah. clearly positive related. So let's, yeah. in pure terms, uh, let's imagine exactly what this means here. So, um, so why this positive relation makes sense? I'm, I'm trying to think about what exactly it means. So I'm volatile in my consumption choice and I'm also volatile in my portfolio choice. Yeah. Uh, so what exactly does this mean here? Well, if you think about individuals, when you think about their consumption volatility, who, who can endure more consumption volatility? It's a more risk tolerance in that investor who has who right. can endure more consumption volatility. So let's compare to two persons. Both of them have, I mean, they have some kind of consumption risk exposure. Then right. one of them have the ability to to have the portfolio choice. So another guy just have no financial tools. Right. So one, so we to observe one of them has both ma um, measures related. Another one just doesn't exist much at all. So how, I'm trying to imagine how yeah, this and uh, kind of improvement. Your imagination brings, your imagination actually is realized on that plot. The square green dots, these are the individuals. If you think about, these are people who are reluctant, who are not on the FinTech adoption. They have low FinTech adoption. The, the purple stars, right. these are the individuals with high FinTech adoption. You can see their risk taking is higher. So, this so is much more aligned. I got it. Put okay. So risk over risk taking happens if that line instead of being, I don't know. I mean, the future might prove us wrong. But given this data, uh, the line is the regression coefficient is uh, close to one, but not yet one. So what's over risk taking? Over risk taking will be somebody who are uh, who have very low consumption ball. That person should not take so much risk, but he is somewhere here. That would be over risk taking. So how do you know the relation is kind of linear? I mean, one or <laughs> why, why would two, which one is good? How do you know that? Well, we know that in theory, that relation is one, one for one. Well, I'm not sure it's one for one, is it? Yeah, well, we normalize this. We normalize, this is very much a cross-sectional variation. In theory, we know that somebody whose consumption wall is here versus somebody whose consumption wall is, let's say, somewhere here, their investment volatility should be proportional, right? That that's a salient. Yeah. Issue. So so we yeah, are, I think it's uh, I yeah. yeah I'm gradually.
reluctantly convinced by this. I think it's the, uh, no matter what, there should be a positive relation. I mean, we were not sure about coefficient, but there should be a positive relation, which is shown. And uh, with small financial choices, the relation is probably uh, uh, clearer. So that seems to be relevant. The coefficient itself could be up to debate. Yeah, well, I mean, if one day this line goes like this, Maybe that's a cause for concern. Maybe that's over risk taking. Well, if you have investors who have no access to uh, risky asset, then it will be probably variation in consumption vote, but no variation in. No, but I don't think you can you can em emphasize that much because it really depends on how you normalize this, how you draw the graph, because you can see that the even the numbers are not exactly the same. So. So it's, uh, but I think the relation holds, the, the relation makes, makes sense, yeah. yeah. Agree, okay. So, so uh, then I think from, the, from this uh, uh, risk exposure ability, enhanced ability to improve to, to the improved financial welfare, what's the roadmap? Well, that's kind of going back to your second question is that I made an advertisement for our profession, <laughs> maybe for me personally as well. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of um, what's, the, what's the social, you know, in the, in the age of FinTech, what is the social optimal? What, should, what can we do? I guess, as I said, in this paper, we don't have so much to say, but in this paper, we actually did have something to say. In this paper, we look at, because we are seeing people's investment behavior when they move on to FinTech platform. And uh, so far, all of these platforms, when they display information, they basically show you how this firm has performed over the last year, over the last six months. So it's mostly a, a performance-based uh, display in terms of um, information. So I think FinTech platform could do more than that. Because if you only use past performance as the key display in your app, what you find is amplified fund flow uh, performance chasing. That, that's, the, that's the key message in our paper, is that if you don't supervise that piece of information, that information will result in people in coordination basically buying past winners or buying the uh, the high album, buying the top uh, performers. That's the, the key takeaway from this paper. So I, I would say with respect to your second question, um, having more of the thin component, more, more thoughts in terms of how should I design my app, in terms of how should I release my information? How should I do financial education? I think there is a long right. way to go. Yeah, I agree. I think there are two ways to go. One is to uh, bring more the meaning of finance into the into the investment. Uh, it's a richer understanding of what exactly the but how finance benefits uh, investors. The second part is probably from uh, uh, consumption and uh, investment point of view that, that what is beneficial for them. So I think both angles are quite meaningful. Yeah. Yes. I heard cool. from PhD students that Ant does not hire finance graduates. <laughs> so maybe that's a culture that could change. I see. So finally, it's still a job talk. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, uh, we're, we're just cautious. The, the problem with finance is that uh, they are uh, kind of poisoned by the traditional <laughs> thinking. <laughs> so, so this is indeed the case, but that is, I, I, but I'm serious about it. So because uh, you see uh, disruptions and innovations, they have to have a different mindset. And you really were too set in that. I, I was re-educated in the past uh, years. So, so I think there's a lot of meaning in this. Anyway, I'm, I'm stop here. I think he wants to ask something. Hey, Professor Tree. It's a okay. fascinating paper. So I just one comment from as a, as an economist from macro side, especially for consumptions or for development side in terms of uh, financial literacy. 
So usually we measure consumption in terms of volatility or inequalities. We do look at cross time shocks, for example, low interest rate, monetary policy, risk sharing. Oh. So you yeah. might do a sample period, a lot of shocks to allow you to differentiate its cross section variations or because time series shocks is number one. Number two, I should really like this paper, but one also link uh, connection with the literature, especially for the development literature, so-called financial literacy. I do understand you have a fascinating data in terms of education, in terms of in-group in group bias, even same gender group, different education, different location, different home ownership can provide a lot of variation to enrich your results. Again, fascinating paper, looking forward. Thank you. Yes. We would love to do more time series variation, but we only were given uh, two and three months of data. And that's the best we, we can do out of this. We would love to have a, a longer panel to do this study. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and also I think there's one additional question from the chat box. Uh, Drew Haibin asked a question for Professor Pan. So maybe for Chinese households, housing is the largest risky asset class if you are a, a study taking oh. this into account. We, we do have a, a variable in our data says whether this is a, a homeowner or not, but we didn't trust that variable very much. So we, we don't have that. It will be it will be fun to include housing. Housing will dwarf all the rest of the of the investment. Exactly. Thanks. Hi, Hadi. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Hadi, you want you want to question yourself? Yeah, I think I think this will be uh yeah, it's very interesting. I think it's also yeah, I think. Uh, the conclusion is uh, quite intuitive that uh, the, the fintech actually broadened the, the availability of the new financial instruments. Uh, yeah, I think the results are interesting that particularly uh, for financial asset class allocation, uh, I think, uh, yeah, even from industry side, we see that uh, the shift from uh, like bank deposits to the, uh, the new financial instruments. But from the household sector, that the, this is the, the question I'm asking is that, yeah, housing definitely is a dominating, right? In the 70% of total household assets. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure to say how much uh, the FinTech instrument is taking away from traditional uh, bank deposits or because of the housing price inflation expectation is becoming, become much weaker during their sample period. So in terms of new investment flow, uh, probably also, yes, yeah, shifting from one risky class, asset class, to another risky asset class. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah, basically what I'm asking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so if there are no more questions, we will conclude here. So uh, thanks again, Professor Pan, a very interesting paper. So we are looking forward to, to welcome you in our Lohan, uh, Lohan webinar again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Jane. Bye. Bye.